Well, how many of you, this is your first time ever being here, okay? Who's brave enough to raise their hand? Okay, awesome. Anyone else? Let me see. Wonderful. We are so glad you guys are here. And uh, we want to invite, I'm just kidding, we're not going to invite you guys up. Uh, I saw my neighbors here as well, which is awesome to have you guys back. But uh, you guys, I, as I was praying for tonight specifically, I just felt like the Lord wanted to do something very significant in your lives. And a lot of times we come to a Good Friday service because if we're being totally honest, it seems like the right thing to do right? But what if God had something for you tonight that was going to change your life? And what if we leaned into that a little bit and just allowed the Lord to speak to us a bit? So I just want to pray for us right now. The Holy Spirit is already at work. I could, especially that last song when they're singing that, I felt the presence of God just rest in this room. And I've just been looking around and I see how the Lord is touching different people at different times and it's really, really cool, okay? And he's going to keep doing that. And if you are newer to church or newer to an experience like this, you know, maybe talking about the Holy Spirit, you've never heard about that. When you, you, sometimes you can feel the presence of God on you. You know, sometimes it feels like chills. Sometimes it feels like warmth. Uh, it can be a lot of things. But the one thing I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit is trustworthy. So sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we don't realize that he is God, okay? And he's totally trustworthy. And you can trust him with your life. So if you experience him, I just want you to know that he's speaking to you in that moment. So let's just open our hands before him right now, if you feel comfortable doing that with me. I'm just going to ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, he'd speak to me, and that we'd leave here not the same. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. Oh, I just, I sense you just want to do something big tonight. And I, I sense that because the preparation this week was absolutely arduous. <laughs> and tough and I got sick and I'm thankful though that we're all here tonight and I just pray right now whatever it is what you want to do Lord I wouldn't stand in the way of that I partner with you God I pray for each one of us we have our hands open we are in a posture to receive what you have for us God so may we receive it Lord with thanksgiving and joy and partner with what you're doing in the earth in your name we pray amen Amen. Well, yeah, as I prayed, um, this week was kind of one of those weeks where I had to pray like crazy just to get to this point. I have not felt good since like last Saturday, just like stomach pain and it's weird. I, it's not the flu, so if you're freaking out about that, don't worry. Okay, I told the, the worship team in the back, you know, hey, I'm not feeling good. They're like, oh, okay, why didn't you tell us earlier? Could have texted us. Um, but I just, this specific week, you know, I spoke with somebody who um, is close on our staff too. They had nightmares last night and all these different things were happening. Um, and I think the, the thing that stood out to me is that, is it possible that when we are going to take new ground and the Lord is leading us new places that the enemy would attack that? I'd say absolutely. So if you're here tonight, I just want you to know that tonight is going to be a difference maker for you. As much as you want of God, you can receive that tonight especially on Good Friday. And I just want to ask you this, this simple question. How do you respond when you haven't experienced breakthrough in your life? How do you respond when you haven't experienced breakthrough in your life? Let me explain what breakthrough is. It's when the reality of heaven invades your life and situation, right? So it's when you pray and you experience that breakthrough in the prayer where that prayer has been answered. Uh, maybe for you, praying for healing, but nothing seems to happen. How many of you have had that happen before? I did, because I still don't feel great right now. <laughs> Randy is like, do you need a bucket? I'm like, no, that would be tacky. Um, so I got a big stand here. Um, and if you're in the front row, okay. My, I'm glad my wife's not in this service. <laughs> She'd be like, what are you saying? Um, for others of you, uh, you know, asking God to heal a broken relationship, but things seem to actually be getting worse worse. Why is that sometimes? And we're praying, and we're praying, and we're pursuing God, and we're saying, God, just pray that you do this, and it seems like it gets worse, not better, right? Where does your mind and heart go when you aren't experiencing breakthrough in your life? I really want you to think about this right now. When you aren't experiencing breakthrough in your life, where does your mind and your heart go? What conclusions do you draw? For me, I often find myself trying to make my own way when I feel like God isn't working, or at least working fast enough. 
What's this look like for me? Well, God will tell me to wait on him to solve a problem, and I go about trying to fix it. How many fixers in the house? Nudge your husband, okay? I know that is often a husband thing, guy thing. Here's what I want you to know. You can do the right thing at the wrong time, and it's sin, right? And when we try and fix things that it's not time yet, this actually makes things worse every time. Some of you need to write that down. I feel like that's something that I've written down, but still I'm learning, you know? Or for me, you know, when I feel fear about something instead of allowing God's faithfulness from the past to inform my future, I get more fearful and I start trying to control things. How many of you like to control things? Yes. You know, King Saul, he liked to control things. That actually was one of the biggest sins that he struggled with that would eventually lead to him not being king any longer. He got impatient waiting and he took things into his own hands, offering a sacrifice before Samuel could get there. Then Samuel shows up, he's like, what did you do, right? He was impatient. He wasn't seeing the breakthrough and he was like, I need to see it right now. There is a lot on the line for me. So I need to pursue this breakthrough and make it happen myself. But this isn't just King Saul. This isn't just me. This is each one of us here tonight. We all struggle with this. Sometimes we begin to doubt God, God's goodness in our lives when we prayed and we haven't experienced breakthrough. Sometimes we begin to blame God for all the bad things that happen and then credit ourselves for all the good things that happen. Isn't that weird how we do that? Or we pray for a miracle and then it happens and then we're like, it couldn't be God. It couldn't be God. You know, some we explain it was like X, Y, Z, but we prayed for that miracle, right? Recently, I was telling Katie, I said, um, she was like, how do you know if it's God that has answered prayer or not? I said, honestly, I don't know. But I did make a commitment a while back that if I prayed for God to do something and that something happened, that I'd give him the credit. I would lean that direction and not the other, right? Sometimes we begin to doubt God if, if it's even real because things don't seem to be getting better. Sometimes we even will mock God and his ability to do the impossible. You see the world around us do that too. Like, is God really real? And you guys, this is nothing new. In fact, on the day Jesus was crucified, many people doubted and discredited Jesus to his face. He was crucified for claiming to be the king. And many people doubted Jesus because he wasn't working on their timeline. He wasn't working in their way. He wasn't proving himself. How could he be the king of kings if breakthrough wasn't happening yet? And that's the tension of Good Friday that we experience. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Mark 15, 16. It's probably too dark for you to read it, so open your phone app. Okay, or just look ahead. But Mark 15, verse 16, I just want to pick it up here. And there's going to be three examples specifically that we're going to look at of people who doubted the reality of Jesus being king. And I think we can draw a lot from those examples. And this is an important day for us to reflect on our own lives, right? And I hope that you can see some parallels between them and us. And that's not just like we look back on history and we're like, man, they were just terrible people. How could they do that? So Matthew, or Mark 15, 16, it says this. The soldiers took Jesus into the court, courtyard of the governor's headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him, Jesus, in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. It's so evil, right? It's, uh, it's really sick. You know, and when you like look into the reality of what Jesus suffered physically, it's painful to even study it. You know, the other day I was I was literally looking at, you know, just researching a little bit about it. I was like, I was at a coffee shop and I was like just moved to tears. I was like, this is crazy. Sometimes that can get lost on us on a little bit, you know, because we read the story so much. We're like, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, but it was real, right? <clears throat> Then the soldiers, here's what they did. They saluted him, and they taunted him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. 
One of the greatest signs of our worship is when we're willing to bow before the Lord and show him that you really are the king. I am humbled in your presence. And rather than that being a reality for them, they mocked that because they didn't think he was the king. And when they finally were tired of mocking him, I find that interesting. They mocked him so much that eventually they got tired. And Roman soldiers weren't weak people. So eventually, they got so tired and fatigued that they stopped mocking him. They took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. They led him away to be crucified. That's our king. They did that too. First thing I want you to, to see from this is those in power, they mocked Jesus. They mocked Jesus because they thought if he was truly the king, he would live and look like a Roman ruler. And what would that look like? It would look like conquering. It would look like killing. It would look like forcing people to do what you want them to do and get in line. But Jesus was different. They thought if Jesus were king, he would fight. He would prove it. They thought that he would look just like them. And so often what we do with God is we think, God, you need to look like my image, right? You need to look more like me. So when I pray, God, you need to start answering my prayers and do things for me, look like me, submit to me. We would never say that. But so often the conclusions we draw when we mock God show that. If we're not careful, we can become influenced by the prevailing culture of our day. How many of you have experienced that personally? You get just wrapped in to what's going on around us. We begin allowing the world, what the world says about Jesus to become what we believe about Jesus. That he was an upstanding guy, that he was a real figure in history, but that he's dead. They often say Jesus isn't real, or that Jesus isn't the only way to eternal life. That's a really important one right now that there are multiple avenues. You can just kind of pick one. Take a guess on a way to get to heaven, and you're kind of good. The truth is, that's not true at all. There is only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. He's the only way to eternal life, and to experience heaven on earth now, he's the only way. I want you to think today, how does the opinion of the culture around you influence and shape what you believe about God? I just want you to process that. Don't just process it now. I actually would encourage you, think about this at home. Think about this throughout the weekend, how that is shaping you, the culture around you, how that is shaping you. I find for me, it's not like a dramatic shift. Usually it's just a little shift at a time, where the values of the world around me become my own values a little at a time. And before I know it, I realize, man, this is not kingdom. This is not how God designed me to operate and live. And the proper response to that is repentance. And it happens. I want you to think about that. How is culture influencing you and how you believe about God? All right, Mark 15, 21. It goes on to say, A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. They offered him wine, drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, The King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. I want you to check this out. Verse 29, it says, The people passing by Jesus shouted abuse shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then save yourself and come down from the cross. They thought, because breakthrough wasn't happening then, there's no way that Jesus was real. I find it interesting, the parallel of this verse it parallels pretty interestingly with Matthew 4, 5 through 6. Let me read that to you. It says, Then the devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. See the temple again. And said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Again, testing Jesus. If you're really real, prove it to me. 
I just want you guys to know he doesn't feel the need to prove anything to you and to me. Um, when he does something in our life, we can receive that with so much joy and thanksgiving. And he does want to show us how much he loves us, but he doesn't feel a need to prove that he is the king of kings. He doesn't have to. When you are something, you don't have to prove it, right? For instance, those of you who are, like, strong in here, okay? You don't have to be like, I'm strong, right? It, you just are, and you're confident. You're strong. You don't have to prove it. Jesus didn't have to prove anything. I want you to think, when your friends mock the reality of Jesus, does it change what you believe about him? Does it influence you? See, this crowd was mocking Jesus, and I imagine that the temptation in that moment, if you were a believer in Jesus, and you were kind of on the fence, I don't know, now he's kind of on the cross. I don't know if this is real anymore. The temptation would be to kind of fit into the reasonable camp, where it's like, yeah, we believe in science. We believe in reason and logic, all those things. The truth is, those things aren't at odds with what God's kingdom is all about. But the crowd will make you feel like they are. The temptation for people around that crowd was to side with what everyone else was saying. Jesus isn't really the king. You see, he's not getting down from the cross. Why don't you think, when your friends and the people around you doubt Jesus... Does that inform your faith? Or does it remind you that Good Friday was just the preview to the breakthrough that was going to come on Easter Sunday? Mark 15, 31, it goes on to say, the leading priests and teachers of the religious law also mocked Jesus. So now there's a third group. It just keeps getting better and better, okay? The leading priests and teachers of the religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself let the Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe him. See, they wanted to see it in order to have faith. But faith believes in the things we haven't seen yet. And then God honors that. They wanted to see the evidence first and then believe that it was true. And unfortunately, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. Even men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. It just keeps getting worse and worse for him. I want you to write this down. The spiritual leaders, they mocked Jesus. Lack of breakthrough can't be what informs what we believe. Okay? And that's especially pastors. I'd say that to our staff team, you know? If we were in staff meeting, I'd be like, guys, that can't inform us. The idea like, I haven't experienced it, so it can't be real. That statement is pride personified. Well, if I haven't experienced God working that way, and that person over at that church has, that can't be real. I think what we have to begin to do is look at what Scripture says would happen, and even if we haven't experienced a miracle, even if we haven't experienced healing, we say, the Bible says that we would experience that. So I'm not actually going to look to my own experience to tell me what God has in store. I'm going to look to what He promises, and I'm going to keep praying, I'm going to keep believing, keep trusting, even if everyone else around me says, that's foolish. If Jesus said it would be, then we need to seek that. Even if in front of us, even if what we're looking at looks like a mess, you have to remember, if you were there 2,000 years ago, if I was there 2,000 years ago, it would be a real struggle to have faith in Jesus. But we have to hold on. And... One other note, we can't, we can't build our theology around disappointment. Sometimes we do that. And I think we do that to protect ourselves from being hurt. But we can't build our theology, what we believe about God, around disappointments and ways we haven't seen breakthrough. If Jesus said we'd do greater things, then we need to pray into it until we see the breakthrough. We need to stop coming up with fancy reasons why Scripture doesn't, doesn't mean what it really said. When Jesus commissioned his disciples, there was promise after promise in the commissioning. And they had a message to share that would be anointed with power. But then they were told to wait until power came. And what came? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was a gift to be passed down from generation to generation. Something that stirred our hearts. But at some point, people got afraid 
of not having control of God. So we started building God in a box that makes us feel comfortable. But in reality, we aren't, be, we aren't experiencing the goodness that God has for us. When you pray for somebody and God does the miracle, there's nothing more exciting. There's nothing better than that. Especially when you've prayed for years and years and years, and that miracle took decades. It makes it that much sweeter. Maybe for you, you invite someone to come to church with you tonight, and this is a miracle you've been praying for for decades. I promise you, it's probably a lot sweeter than if it just happened immediately. And God built something in you that now you can pass to somebody else because you know what it looks like to wait for breakthrough and to trust that God is going to do something. Here's the big idea for us tonight. When it's Good Friday and we haven't experienced a breakthrough of Easter in our lives yet, we can become doubtful or faithful. We can become doubtful or faithful. Let's talk first about doubtful. Doubt mocks because it's afraid. It's afraid. So it wants to find security in mocking. Doubt sees the impossibility, and it shares that impossibility with others. And if everyone's doubting together, they find comfort that they're not the only ones doubting, right? It, again, it's that idea. If I haven't experienced a breakthrough, then God can't be real. How wrong are we? Remember, we're talking about Good Friday. So if you were there on Good Friday and you didn't experience the breakthrough yet, does that mean that breakthrough wasn't real? No, you just had to wait a little bit longer. If I haven't experienced a breakthrough, my doubt leads my life. That's what being doubt, doubtful is. I have a friend who used to be a pastor that was an awesome, like he was an awesome worship pastor. He was very creative, a ton of gifts. And then he had some things in life not go great. And then he allowed those things to become the reason not to follow God anymore. And now he does everything he can to stir up others in that doubt. A lot of times our hurt and pain and not seeing breakthrough, if we allow doubt to then shape us, can keep us trapped in a place where we're not living in the reality of the kingdom that is true. And doubt, it hurts us and it hurts others. But let's talk about being faithful because I believe that's who God is calling this group of people to be, you and me. Faith believes in that which is not yet seen. Like when I look out at this crowd right now, you know, I see some of you who are new. I don't see you where you are right now. I see where God wants you to be 10 years from now. So I'm actually preaching to that person and not this person that's in the room. That's what we need to do with faithfulness. Like when we look at people around us, we're not seeing how they are today. We're seeing who God created them to be and how they are growing into that person. Even if I haven't experienced a breakthrough, I'm confident that it is coming. My faith isn't shaped by what I see, but by who I know. And if I know the character of Jesus, I can trust him. I can trust him. I love what N.T. Wright says. He says, we are an Easter people. Like that's our identity. But we live in a kind of Good Friday world. We're like in between two realities, the already not yet of the kingdom. There's a lot of pain and suffering here, but when Jesus came down to earth, he brought his kingdom here. So that's why we can experience miracles here today, not just when we die and go to heaven, but there's also a lot of pain around us too. We need to bring this reality that we're Easter people into every situation we face. That Good Friday is just the start of the weekend. How many of you like weekends? How many of you like weekends? Because you get to wake up super early on Sunday mornings, right? But Good Friday, it's, it's just this, yeah, our worship team has to wake up like really early. So I'm glad I'm not on the worship team. I used to do that a lot. Um, but Good Friday, again, it's just the start of the weekend. There's more to the weekend, but it's an important part. And it's going to be a great weekend this weekend because we're reminded that breakthrough is right around the corner. And really what we're supposed to grasp tonight is that that is in life too. That when you're praying for something and nothing's happening that you can see, don't give up. Don't give up. 
It doesn't mean that God's not working. We just don't exactly know how he's working in that moment. But we need to have a radical faith that says, I will trust him no matter what I see with my eyes. We need to begin to see with spiritual eyes. Man, I prayed for that person and it sounds like they've got a worse attitude than they did when I talked to them last. Like, what happened? My prayers like work in the opposite. Do I need to pray that they have a bad attitude? No, it's just, there's a process. There's a process. And there's a process in the people we pray for, but there's also a process in you where God is wanting to establish a faith that isn't based on what you're seeing yet, but on his promises. And we have to hang on every promise we find in scripture. So when Jesus says, you're going to do even greater things, and that is the thing that I have for us tonight that God just kept putting on my heart. We're going to do even greater things than he did when he was on the earth. When we haven't seen that yet, don't rewrite scripture to fit your experience. Don't say, well, when he talked about doing even greater things, he was talking about like the church would kind of grow and we would have like social media to reach more people. And no, there was also implication that we would walk in miracles. We would walk in the miraculous. That people with tumors, those tumors would dissolve. It says that the dead would be raised to life. I haven't seen that yet, but who am I to say God would never do that? In fact, it says in Scripture that he would, so I need to pray and believe that. We're all growing in this. Have you ever prayed for somebody who's dead to come back to life? It's hard. It's hard. God is calling us, though, to something fresh and new where we really trust him. So two things, really, for us tonight. Two application steps. The first is this. Some of you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus tonight for the first time or once again. You've walked away. I'm going to pray for you guys. And let me just clear this up. A lot of times we think we give our lives to Jesus just so that we can have um, an entrance into heaven when we die. So then we live our whole life without inviting God into it. And we miss out on the blessing of being in relationship with God. We can actually experience his kingdom here and now. We can actually invite him into situations that are way beyond us. Say, Holy Spirit, I need you right now. And what, I I, I quote this all the time. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. You would know it, Zach. Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard talks all the time about how when he dies, he doesn't want to really be able to tell he died because he had so much of heaven in him that it almost felt like he was going into the same place. I always, I love that because that's what I want too. I'm far from that right now, but I want that. Some of you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus today, and that's your first step. That's not the only thing you ever do from this day until you die, though. You're giving him your life. So over time, he's going to show you more and more things. As you live in community with people here, you're going to grow. You've got to place yourself there, though. And then for others, some of you need to repent for allowing lack of breakthrough to shape your belief in God's goodness. And this is for the believers. A lot of times we don't think God is good anymore because we haven't experienced breakthrough. And I do want to be sensitive. A lot of us have experienced things that are beyond painful. So what I'm not saying is those things aren't painful. They're incredibly painful. But those are not God. That's what sin and death brought in the world, in the garden. And what Jesus is doing, he's making all things new. And he's doing that in each one of us so that we can be a part of the story that he's writing in the earth. The story is not just about you. It's not just about me. American Christianity would tell you that. Just tune in to your favorite pastor and it's all about you because they're looking at you on the screen. But it's really not. The New Testament was written to churches and communities, never written to just one person, right? We have to live in community together if we're going to be the bride of Christ. So what I want to do now is just really simple. For those of you that need to put your faith and trust in Jesus today, I just want you to go ahead, just lift your hand. This is for you and God right now. Don't worry about people around you. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else?
Awesome, I see you. Thank you. Wonderful. Love it. Beautiful. Great. And really, in your own words, whether you say it out loud or not, just tell the Lord, I want what you have for me. I want to take this journey with you. I ask that you forgive my sin and that you would show me what it means to walk with you and walk with others to follow you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So you just made the most important decision in your life, but now you get to step into the fullness of what that will look like. And that will be a lifelong journey that we're discovering together. But for those of you that need to repent for allowing lack of breakthrough to shape your belief in God's goodness, I just want to pray over you right now. So for you guys, go ahead and just raise both hands. Okay? This is an act of surrender to God right now. So go ahead and just lift your hands. Tim, right now I'm just going to pray over you. God, I pray right now, as we repent for allowing a lack of breakthrough to shape our belief in your goodness, God, we pray, Lord, that we'd remember that we're Easter people, God, that we have seen more of the story than those people saw on Good Friday. And that if you did it then, you'll do it now. So God, I pray that you give us patient endurance, Lord, even when we're praying for the thing that is so heavy on our heart and we're not seeing any change yet. And in fact, it looks like it's sliding backwards, God. And when everyone around us is telling us, you're so stupid for praying, it doesn't work. Everyone around us gets mad at us even. I pray, Lord, that we'd have a quiet resolve that you are good and that you are working. And I pray, Lord, that you would inform our faith, not what we see with our eyes. Just pray that in your name. Amen. Amen.